All right, you guys are live. Phones are off, everybody. Put your phones on mute. Uh, good afternoon. We're happy that you are here to join us on uh, the Get Serious Louisiana COVID-19 Unmasked in Rural Louisiana uh, Town Hall Meeting. We've got a wonderful group of Louisianians who have joined us this evening to talk about what's happening in the river parishes of Louisiana, the small towns along the mighty Mississippi River and all the things that go on in that rich part of our culture. Um, my co-host this afternoon is uh, Mr. Daryl Hambrick. He is the owner of Hambrick's Mortuary. He's also the executive director of the River Road African American Museum amongst enough, a bunch of other things that he does. He's a regular Renaissance man. Daryl, uh, hey, introduce yourself a little bit tonight. Yeah, um, once again, I'm the uh, owner and a licensed funeral director, director with the state of Louisiana. Uh, been in the funeral business for 45 years this year. Uh, we started in 1975. I'm the co-founder of the River Road African American Museum uh, in Donisonville and uh, community activist, servant, and uh, just care of uh, and love for our people, and especially during these times. Thank you, Daryl. My name is Todd Sterling. I own Alpha Media and Public Relations. And, uh, you know, we're going to open up tonight with a little bit of a statement about what's going on. Louisiana and the world has been affected by the coronavirus pandemic, literally shutting down a lot of America for three plus months. Louisiana has kind of seen the worst of it. We were the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic, and uh, we're working hard as a state to fight COVID-19, but there's still a lot of work to be done. We'd actually seen a lot of success, and unfortunately, after the 4th of July, it seemed like uh, the numbers have spiked again, so we're in a really, really precarious position as a state. Uh, as a matter of fact, Vice President Pence was in town today to talk about uh, the COVID-19 situation and higher education. So I'm sure uh, you'll be seeing lots of his uh, comments tonight on the news. Tonight, we have a panel of Louisianans that are focused on what's been happening with COVID-19 in rural parishes, and in particular, the river parishes, as I said earlier. They're home to sugarcane farms, um, uh, other farming products, the chemical plant corridor, ports, uh, uh, all along the Mississippi River, but they're also home to grocery stores. They're home to uh, uh, funeral homes. Of course, there's always going to be an education component. Uh, there's a number of things that everywhere else you have in America, you've got in this corridor, and they're all hardworking people, and they have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Tonight, we're going to hear some of their stories and talk about some of the things that they're doing with their families. Uh, and we'll talk about solutions to try to help us manage this coronavirus uh, pandemic. You met my co-host, um, Daryl Hambrick. Again, I'm Todd Sterling. And the first thing that we want to do is uh, introduce our panel. Uh, we've got a really great panel of folks who are uh, uh, dyed in the wool Louisianians. Most of them are from here, born here, love Louisiana like I do, and uh, really, really want to see the best for our state. Uh, Howard, you, you see their, you see their uh, screens and their names. Howard, can you bring up the uh, bios of the um, panelists so people can see uh, who they are? And we'll try to give a quick rundown uh, of who our panelists are. Um, I'll, I'll start while Howard brings that up. I'll start, we've got uh, Ms. Leslie Fluence. Uh, um, okay, here we go, thank you. Uh, Representative Ken Brass, who's not on yet, He'll be joining us. He's actually at a school board meeting. He represents District 58. Um, and um, uh, he, along with Senator uh, Ed Price, uh, just finished up a legislative session. Uh, I'm sure they'll have a lot to tell us about what's happening at the State House and what's going on uh, with uh, the legislature, COVID-19 and all of that. We've got Reverend Whitney Castine who's a pastor at Trinity AME. He's also a project manager at Franklin Industry, at Franklin Associates. Uh, we've got Mr. Daryl Comrie, a veteran in education in Ascension Parish. We got Ms. Carnet Carmaine Dickerson, who's uh, a funeral director and owner at Demby and Son Funeral Home 
Uh, it's a family business that she's a part of. Uh, we've got Miss Leslie Fluence. She's a licensed master social worker and a mom of four. Uh, she does some great work in the community. Reverend Jonathan Hill, he's a Renaissance man. He's doing about 50 different things. And in addition to being a constable for EBR, he's a project manager at Franklin Associates. He's an alpha man. He's also an executive pastor. Joining us tonight will hopefully be Dr. Stephen Kelly, uh, my cardiologist. Uh, he hails from the University of Arkansas, but has been in Baton Rouge for probably 20 plus years and has a nonprofit called Jumpstart Your Heart that makes sure high school athletes' hearts are in top shape. We've got Kirk Mitchell, who's a petrochemical industry vet. Uh, he's from Donaldsonville, Louisiana. We've got Miss Iris Moran, who's a registered nurse, also a native of Donaldsonville. Mark Peters is a longtime uh, youth activities educator uh, uh, and professional. Uh, he's got a, a profit. Howard, can you uh, scroll it up? He's got a nonprofit. Um, Hope Youth Development and works with kids. Uh, we've also got uh, Staff Sergeant Danielle Plaisance, who's a part of the Ascension Parish uh, Sheriff's Department uh, and a Donaldsonville native. Uh, and then of course, last but not least, my doctor, Dr. Ronnie Whitfield, also known as the hip hop doc. Yeah, he's the, the, the proud papa of his uh, uh, fresh son, RJ, and his uh, lovely daughter, Raina, and uh, he and I have known each other forever in addition to being my doctor. So we want to say thank you to all the panelists. We appreciate you guys uh, sitting in tonight uh, to kind of give the folks who are tuning in an opportunity to hear what's going on in rural Louisiana. So we want to start off and uh, ask you guys a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how has COVID-19 affected your life professionally? And uh, we'll start off with uh, Mark Peters. Mark, how has COVID affected your life professionally? Uh, we've uh, been able to deal, work with kids uh, this summer in the beginning. Uh, once they closed some of the parks here in the area, uh, we were able, we had to stop. Uh, so we probably took uh, two to three weeks off and uh, once they op reopened the parks, we were able to resume some of the uh, summer tennis lessons for the kids. Okay, appreciate that. Um, Leslie, how about you? Can you hear me right? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, good. I, um, I was a, a master social work with, I was working with St. Joseph Hospice as a medical social worker. That's what I was trying to get to, as a medical social worker. And working with hospice, we were going into different homes, um, dealing with um, anywhere from five to seven patients a day. So during, at the beginning of COVID, a lot of patients opted out of uh, services, especially for the social worker. They'd rather see the nurse because of the fear of, of contracting COVID and dealing with, you know, hospice patients that were compromised had their immune system compromised so eventually because of the um restrictions at home as well because i have a my husband had a stroke several years ago and um they wouldn't allow the job would not allow me to do telephone or telehealth as other uh agencies that i work with they you know we all do the telehealth so I had to go ahead and resign from that position as a clinical social, I mean, as a you know, medical social worker. Interesting. So that's how it affected me there. Wow. Kurt, talk to us about what's happening in the petrochemical industry. Uh, I work in the chemical industry. So uh, the chemical industry, especially along the river, uh, we play a vital role in the economic global chain. So it's, it's important that we, even though uh, we're concerned about the health of everyone, it is uh, detrimental to the economy that we continue to run these facilities. So uh, we, what we've been trying to do is to allow people who can work from home to work from home. However, there are some people, especially in operations that have to continue to work. I'm one of those people. Uh, and it's, it's not just about the economy, uh, the some of the, the things that our facilities make 
are very vital to dealing with the, uh, the virus and uh, keeping us healthy. Let me name some of the products that are made from the facilities right here on the river. Uh, medical equipment that's including uh, ventilators and surgical kits, uh, syringes, the, the gowns, the drapes, soap, the disinfectants, uh, the uh, medical supplies, surgical hand disinfectants, the sanitizers, all these things are important. We all know we've been using a lot of hand sanitizers, probably more than we've ever done in the past. So it's very important to keep these facilities open and staff. So it's been difficult, but uh, we've been trying to, uh, to do that. And actually we have been doing that. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, let's turn the corner. Carmaine, you're a mother. Uh, talk to us about how your family has dealt with COVID-19, you know, quarantining, wearing masks, or your family just kind of doing what they want, like a lot of people. No, so my family um, we actually had to quarantine because my husband and my son were both tested positive for COVID-19, so we had to wow. quarantine for two weeks. And I actually just got off the quarantine yesterday. It was my 14 day. So I'm back at work now and it's been really hard not being able to go to work. And now my uncle has it and his wife and another one of our employees tested positive also. So now we're like, um, what do we do? You know, who's gonna go to work? And we can't not just not go to work at a funeral home because people die every day and they're dying more now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Iris, talk to us a little bit. How's your family been affected? Do you, do you, um, have you guys been um, trying to follow the, the, the direction of the governor, masking up, social distancing, or is your family just kind of out there doing their own thing? Well, for the most part, my family um, is pretty much doing what the government, governor is asking um, due to most of my, my mother and my aunts are over the age. So I constantly tell them that they have to mask and they have to quarantine. So we are uh, on a daily uh, routine of me checking them because, um, you know, by me being the nurse, I tend to have that tendency of wanting to keep everyone safe. Yeah, I bet. Uh, Senator Price. Talk to us about your family. What have they been doing uh, during this time? Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, like everyone else, we've been very, very close in uh, trying to follow the, the, the governor's the CDC guidelines by staying in, mm -hmm. uh, social distancing. Uh, right now, just me and my wife at home, so uh, we, we can be there. But when you get used to being around family a lot and you no longer can do that, it's kind of depressing at times, but we've managed uh, very much so and we'll continue to, to follow the guidelines. Uh, this COVID-19 has affected a lot of people, no one personally in my family, but I know a lot of people along the river who have succumbed to this, uh, this virus. And I got a lot of calls early on and people were saying, oh, they're working in your campaign. And it's really, really tough when you start hearing from people saying, people who are out there walking the street with you doing those type of things and they're no longer with us. So it's been very tough, but uh, hopefully and prayerfully, we're gonna survive this and, and move on to another uh, situation at some point. But it's been real tough. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Uh, Reverend Castine, how do you feel the state of Louisiana has responded to the pandemic? Yeah, let me just say I'm, I'm proud of the leadership that our governor has um, displayed in trying to manage this response to the best of his ability. I think that the governor has been very communicative. He's been very fair, uh, been very thorough, trying to put forward some of the best experts that our, states ha that our state has to offer. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the governor has done a good job, even as recently as today, even just recently as last week, he continues to try to move the state forward. I also want to say that I think much of it now is in our hands, right, uh, in being responsive to the things that the governor has said to us, being uh, responsive to what other public health experts are saying to us, and frankly, being responsive to what we now know as common sense and being uh, good neighbors and good citizens. Thank you. 
Daryl Comrie, how do you feel the state has responded to the pandemic? Hey, first of all, I just want to thank you for um, allowing me to, to be on this platform tonight with these um, with the other guests. Um, I think as far as with education, I think they did the best as they could, you know, when, when it hit in March. Um, I don't think anybody was ready for it uh, as far as uh, school building principal. That was something new for me. We've been through hurricanes, uh, just never been through a pandemic on this level. Um, so I think uh, once we got kids out of the building, uh, we were at ease. Um, we still had employees that had to return for a few more days. So that brought us a concern. So as far as education, just help first from our faculty, staff, and students and community members. And then secondly, um, just how can we make sure that our kids don't get behind because they're already behind um, in the Donaldsonville schools. Yeah, thank you. Um, let, me, let me throw it to uh, Jonathan Hill. Jonathan, I want to uh, ask you the next question. What are the best practices for your workplace and moving forward? As I said earlier, you're, you're a constable. You're also, you work at Franklin Industries uh, Associates. Tell us a little bit about what's happening at your workplace and what you've seen to be the best things to happen in the workplace. Well, I think uh, just being flexible, right? Understanding that this is a very new for most of us and admitting that none of us are experts in this or realizing that many of the things that we felt that we have to show up to a physical structure to do, uh, to a building to some degree can now be done online for some people. And so I think uh, navigating that space has been unique and interesting, but also just being honest with your employees that if you are sick, stay at home, uh, take care of yourself, make sure your well-being and your family are taken care of first before you try to come back to work to uh, finish your job. And so the things that we've implemented has been a lot of online engagement, which I think we've saw an increase in productivity as a result of that. Incredible. Dr. Whitfield, uh, as I said earlier, you know, full disclosure, Dr. Whitfield is my doc, and uh, I had a wellness check with him, and, and I think his uh, nurse called me and wanted to do a telehealth, and I said, no, baby, I'm old. You got to see me to get my money. Dr. Whitfield, talk to us a little bit about how uh, the workplace has changed for you doctors and in the medical space. Well, that, that's, you hit the nail on the head. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I had, had been practicing and doing some, some limited telemedicine prior to the pandemic. So I was comfortable with what we call an electronic medical system or electronic health records in our office. We use a system called Epic. And so this system contains all of your health data, um, quality measures, when you, when you need a colonoscopy, when you need to have a wellness exam. So we had to mobilize and engage, you know, immediately. So that was in place already. So transition for us wasn't too hard. But, you know, many folks are saying, well, what did you do? What did you do different? Well, some of the stuff we're supposed to be doing anyway. So as far as keeping the offices clean, sanitized, now we've upped that ante a little bit, and I'm wearing a mask in the room with each patient. There's no, you know, hi, I'm Todd. I grip you up with frat brothers as well as doctor patient and, and brothers and friends. But, you know, that, that, that has changed. So the lovey-dovey Dr. Whitford that used to get is going to have to be a lot of humor and a lot of discussion because we're not even touch and contact, but telemedicine, telemedicine was the big change. And also, you know, quelling some of the fires and trying to, to, to assure folks that this too shall pass, but it's gonna be a while. And if we don't practice those behaviors, and as your campaign says, uh, use your head, stop the spread. If we don't social distance, wash our hands frequently, uh, avoid non-essential travel uh, and mask up. Um, and I don't know how masking has been politicized, and I guess I do know how it's been politicized. Um, then we're gonna be in this situation for a lot longer than we need to be. Yeah. yeah. Staff Sergeant uh, Plaisance, can you talk to us about how you guys have adjusted to uh, this COVID-19 era working in the uh, law enforcement space? Danielle, are you with us? Are you on can mute? You hit, can yes, you hit sir. He, he had muted me. Um, I'm the actual Staff Sergeant I'm over the transportation, well, one of the supervisors that's over the transportation division. And since COVID-19 has hit, we have had to change a lot of ways of how we deal with the inmates. My division, we're responsible for getting inmates to and from court. We bring them to and from their medical appointments. We're also responsible for going to different agencies when an offender has an active warrant in our parish or for our agency and they're in another agency. It 
has changed drastically. We, since COVID-19 is hit, we have transitioned to where the inmates really don't leave the jail. Um, they only leave for extreme medical purposes. We have transitioned to the inmates are seen through the TV screens for court. A lot of their medical appointments that we were able to transition and do telemeds with them. We now have to be cautious with not only how we deal with inmates because we are still considered essential workers. Some of us have to come home to our families. It has changed the way you deal with the offenders, but it has also changed in ways that you deal with your actual family members. Yeah, yeah. Daryl, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how it's changed in the funeral home workplace? You're on mute, Daryl. Hey, yeah. Uh, there you go. I've been in this business um, just about my entire life, and, and most people are are afraid of the funeral business. Well, first time in my lifetime, I've been afraid of going to my job. Uh, I've never been afraid of the dead, never had that experience, but when COVID hit, it made, it, it just took a whole nother turn. Even though we practice universal precautions at all measures, with all cases, because um, there's diseases out there prior to COVID that in the funeral business that you're constantly uh, confronted with, so we always use universal precaution, but with COVID, it just sent another signal. Uh, I was concerned about my employees. I was concerned about customers coming into my business. I was concerned about taking my business out into the community, going into churches, going into public spaces. How do I deal with a family who has a loved one who's been sick? They've been exposed and now they're in my business uh, making arrangements uh, for a funeral. And then uh, the majority of them have been around or each other and have contact, has uh, had contact with each other. And now here I am trying to help them through this process. Uh, changed drastically. Um, the first funeral that I had, um, I watched the minister come out from behind the pulpit with a mask on. I'm sitting there looking at a family sitting um, six feet apart, trying to distance themselves from each other. When in the funeral industry, this is a time when we as black people, we come together. We want to be together. We have to be together. This is how we get through our whole grieving process. So how do you tell a family now that you can't, I can limit 10 people to a funeral. Uh, we got to have a graveside funeral. We can't have a church service. Um, so as you can see, it has affected our entire industry uh, on how we deal with families. And I'm quite sure uh, Carmaine can, uh, can, can chime in on that. Am I right, Carmaine? Yes, I totally agree with everything you said. You know, we're practicing the same precautions and it's hard for, say, a, the matriarch of a family, an 80 year old grandmother to pass and then you have to tell her children and grandchildren that some of them may not be able to come to the service. And, and that's not even including like her neighbors and friends and church members who want to come and, and you know, they want to have a home going celebration for their, the, matriarch, the matriarch of their family and they cannot. And they're not understanding this. They can't understand that they cannot. You know, they want to have this, what they, they want to have, what they're used to. And then we have to tell them, I'm sorry, but only so many people can, is allowed to come. And people, are, they are not grieving. They're not given the opportunity to because we have to, if someone dies from COVID, they have to be buried or cremated within five days is what the CDC recommends. And that's hard. Yeah. The thing is that no. if, if we get cases where we don't know if they have, it, if you haven't been diagnosed, just imagine uh, people who, who, who may be in a car accident or some other type of incident, and we receive those remains and we don't know if they've been exposed or not. Right. But then you go and prepare funerals to have these services, just like we know traditionally COVID or non-COVID. We've been treating everybody as if they've had COVID and we have to keep that, not for the, 
the, the remains purpose or the deceased, but for the people that come to the service. Right. 10 people come to make arrangements for a funeral just to make the arrangements. And so yeah. how do I tell them that they can't come and be a part of this um, process, which, you know, is life changing? Yeah, you know, uh, in the PR and advertising world, um, it, you know, meetings face to face, uh, gatherings where you normally have punch, cookies and chips, they have all changed and, you know, everything has gone to a Zoom meeting and we're Zoom, Zoom, Zooming uh, every day uh, to make things happen. Uh, quite honestly, there has been a lot of productivity uh, based on the necessity to have productivity but in the same sense for people like me who are people persons and my gift is with people, um, it's a challenge uh, to pivot in this space of, you know, Zoom meetings and not being able to see and use your personality to work with people. We got to turn the corner, guys. Uh, we want to talk about the numbers. Uh, you know, one of the things that is really, really uh, strange about this coronavirus is that when it initially hit, it hit hard and uh, it really hit with a lot of people being infected. I wanna say, if I remember correctly, 20 Zulu members died of the Zulu Social uh, Aid and Pleasure Club in New Orleans. And uh, it was one of those things that, you know, I think we were all just kind of taken aback. And the Louisiana Department of Health puts up this graphic you see every day and they have really great information if you wanna keep up with what's going on with coronavirus in the state. They've got uh, uh, information that can uh, keep you up to date. Uh, but this graphic actually shows you uh, the, the number of cases reported, as you can see, as of today, 82,000 cases. And of those 82,000 cases, we've had 333, I'm sorry, 3,337 deaths. And, you know, um, some people would like to downplay those numbers and say that's just kind of par for the course with flu but I, I beg to differ I think it's uh, a little bit more sinister than flu uh, and it's definitely affected people differently those people with comorbidities uh, we're gonna let Dr. Whitfield speak to that in a second but those people that have uh, high blood pressure uh, uh, asthma diabetes that are obese uh, coronavirus can take you up out of here uh, with the quickness. You know, if you're a little healthier, you might be able to fight it off. But one thing about it is, it's been affecting everyone a little differently. Again, the Department of Health has this graphic up if you wanna keep up with these kinds of numbers. Uh, but there's also other numbers out there. And, you know, I think that's one of the challenges uh, in dealing with this. Uh, Dr. Whitfield, what is your take as a medical professional about showing these numbers? Uh, what is your take about, you know, uh, keeping people up to date with what's going on? And do you think it helps people to uh, mask up and, and do some of the, the, the uh, warnings that the governor talks about? Or do you think people are just kind of immune to the numbers now? Uh, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, first of all, the numbers are real. Uh, you got to think the flu probably kills on average 50,000 a season. We're looking at 137,000 deaths. Have 133,000 deaths, uh, predicting to probably be close to 200,000 people that will be dead. So that's filling, filling LSU Stadium up twice, and all those people are gone. Yeah. And so uh, that's a lot of folks to die. So one is too many, but these these numbers have names to them now. So they're they're folks that we we actually know. And me personally, I've lost over eight patients. All of them have been African American, mostly male, mostly all of them had hypertension, and so those chronic underlying health conditions are there. You know, Todd, it was, it was quite interesting that everybody was like, oh, wow, this is happening. I can't believe black folks are dying. Every epidemic, every pandemic, Katrina, Rita, whatever happens, always exposes the um, weakness in the health fibers of our country. And so you wonder why a 51-year-old man is going around calling himself a hip-hop doc trying to talk to young people about health issues. It's because we know that these things exist in the black community, like what's going to be done now. So it's very important. I think black folks need to have a wake up call to realize that we are uh, behind the eight ball when it comes to these chronic conditions. Chronic kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes are impacting and killing us before COVID-19. And so now you have this disease that seems to be targeting individuals that have that. And so this has to be a wake up call for us. So we, we, we first, we gotta get out of this thing. 
when we get out of it, we need to be preparing for what's going to happen in the future. But I think the numbers are good. Some folks are just not taking it seriously enough. Um, I use them every day to try to convince folks. And then when you can put a name to a number, when some of these folks start losing their own family members, I think they'll, they'll begin to take this a little bit more seriously. Thank you, Dr. Whitfield. Um, Iris, can you chime in on the numbers and what the numbers mean to you and your space as a nurse? Yes, um, the numbers are real, Dr. Winfield, and um, I see it every day in my field because my patients' are immune system is not the norm. They are totally downhill. So when we're there trying to educate them on um, being safe, wear your mask around your family included, it is that, you know, the dialysis patients are struggling daily. So when you add the pandemic to it, it's a double whammy. So my job there is to educate them and pray that they understand and listen to what we're saying. Our numbers at our clinic is low in death. And it's due to the fact that every time they hit that door, I'm preaching and they are telling me, uh, Miss Iris, you're always saying the same thing. I said, but I'm trying to save your life. So once they understand that you can't be around your family members who are going out to the stores or to the clubs or to wherever they're going and come back here because then you will cause a cluster here. So if you talk to them, I feel if I talk to them real, they will understand better. So that's the numbers I see um, daily. I'm looking at my patient's survivor you know, surviving this thing and getting on the other side. And so we've lost some, but not as many as we could. Thank you, Iris. You know, right now we want to pivot a little bit and um, get everybody um, to turn their cameras off, except for Dr. Whitfield, Dr. Kelly, Carmaine, uh, Daryl, Leslie, and Iris. Uh, we wanted to have a little bit of the medical professions and the funeral directors conversation and we'll bring all you other guys back up shortly. So, um, you know, uh, is Dr. Kelly on? Dr. Stephen Kelly made it? No? Okay. Anyway, um, Dr. Whitfield, Iris, you know, I, I guess the question becomes from the medical profession, have we reached, reached critical mass in what you guys can handle in the medical profession? Are we headed for a crash? You know, early on in this thing, I thought that we'd be in a space where if people didn't heed the warnings that some of our best and brightest in the medical profession, doctors, nurses, uh, all those professionals would be compromised because they'd be working crazy hours and uh, PPP uh, supply was a challenge. Uh, have we reached critical mass or do we kind of have this thing under control? Where are we uh, in the healthcare uh, arena right now with this COVID-19 pandemic? I'll let Iris start on it, Todd. Um, I think we have not reached that yet. Uh, we are still struggling to meet the needs of the PPE. Uh, we're still struggling to get the people to understand that this is a real virus. It kills you. It does, it plays for a little while, but it's real. So I really think, um, the educated, education part of it is just keep preaching, wear your masks, distance, quarantine, all of those things are key factors, you know, in this. So um, once our younger generation, um, once our younger generations realize, like, like Dr. Whitfield say, um, it hasn't hit home yet to them. I don't think they understand the masses of it. So once they get it, I'm pretty sure that we will be able to get a handle on it. But for now, they're not getting it. And the numbers are raging. And we are going back to phase one, you know, and I can see the governor closing or shutting us down again, because, you know, the, the numbers are just high. So we just got to keep we as on this panel, us on this panel need to just keep talking to everyone we meet and let them know that, you know, this is not a game, this is real, this is real. And I have a lot of friends that is 
in the hospital, you know, ICU, looking at this going on daily, and they are totally exhausted. And I think it's more because they see the deaths, you know, the number of deaths daily. It's not a weekly thing. When I was in the hospital, ICU, and all the other floors, you would see somebody die about twice a week. Now you see numbers dying daily. So that's the, that's the part we need to get out there and let them know that, you know, it's our families that's dying, our family members dying, you know, and you all need to take charge and, and play it safe. You know, um, as we were rolling out the advertising campaign for this Get Serious platform, had a chance to interview, um, uh, shoot a spot with Dr. Lauren Barrio in New Orleans. And, you know, she told me something that really, really stayed with me. And it stays with me to this day that for probably about a month or more, every day she was declaring somebody dead and putting somebody on a ventilator. And, uh, you know, I don't think the public knew how invasive uh, a ventilator is to a human body. And most people don't come back from being intubated uh, healthy or 100%. Dr. Whitfield, can you talk to us about uh, exactly what happens when you actually go to the hospital and the care you get when you have coronavirus? So, you know, first of all, the, the hospitals are very, very clean. Everyone is separated. So you're going to a COVID unit or COVID side of the hospital or non-COVID side. And that's going to be based on symptoms and their assessment. Um, when these individuals, when our patients start to crash and burn, when they start having respiratory difficulties, can't breathe, shorter breath, high fevers, high temperatures, they're usually managed in the intensive care unit of the ICU. I'm sure everybody's hearing all these terminologies now. Um, I feel like I'm going back to medical school because they were, they were asking at one time how comfortable we were as family doctors who don't practice in the hospital as much, uh, intubating, which we did long times ago in residency. If that patient enters the ICU, there's several options to get them oxygen. So the reason that they're put on the ventilator is because they're not able to breathe. So the ventilator is a means of providing oxygen, uh, humidification, and air so that the patient can, can breathe uh, on their own. So they're struggling. But the, 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 the um, a ventilators can actually be quite dangerous and can harm the lungs. You, you're forcing air into the body and a person's kind of forcing against it. And so you have to sedate people. It takes a team of folks to do them. You gotta have all your PPE on because now you're at risk of getting infected. So it's a, it's, a, it's a rigorous task. It requires a team of people to manage. And that's why in some states, and people thought this was, was a joke, but they were like, we have to decide who we're gonna try to save and who, who we gotta let go. Yeah. And that was a real decision that some doctors have to make. Not that they actually said, well, look, we're gonna let bed A die and let bed B. But if the person that was surviving or doing the best at the time, it would probably expend more energy on that person because we're short of hospital beds and we're short staff. And so that's kind of a, a scenario that happens in the ERs and the, and the hospital settings. And then these individuals can remain in the hospital for four to six weeks on a ventilator, um, occupying space that somebody else can use. So a lot of my patients had to be sent to the emergency room three and four times before they were admitted because they just weren't that, they were ginger, they were on a fence, but they didn't have a space for them. So initially, Todd, we were told, hey, if a patient has minimal symptoms, just tell them to quarantine at home and then three days, send them back to work. That changed to 14 days quarantine. We were told incubation periods were changing. So we were learning on the job. So even with masking, the masking was initially maybe not recommended, maybe it was. And now you know it's a hardcore recommendation if you cannot physically or social distance from someone and just wear a mask. So things are evolving. I'm back in medical school. I'm learning virology. I'm learning about ventilators again. You know, stuff that I didn't think I would have to do or see in this lifetime. So it's a, it's a, it's a horrific experience. It's very challenging. Uh, shouts out to all of my first line workers, the first responders, those folks that are in the hospitals, the emergency rooms. They have a tough job, and uh, yeah. shout out to them. I mean, again, they say I'm front lines, but I had the privilege and luxury to work behind a computer and do telemedicine and see very minimal patients for a couple of weeks. These guys are in there exposing themselves, having to go home to their families and potentially infecting them. So it's it's been a challenging time. No, none of the none of my colleagues that I know trained to practice medicine in the pandemic. This is my first and hopefully my last. I'm 51 years old, so I hope I won't see one of these again. But none of us were trained. We heard about pandemics. We knew a virus might come one day, but not, not like 1918, not like the Spanish flu. Yeah, you know, uh, before we start talking to the funeral home directors, uh, I do want to ask, uh, as medical professionals, what do you want to tell the people out here in the streets, those folks who are going out on a Friday and Saturday night, those folks who choose not to wear masks? Uh, what do you want to tell those people? Because 
you know, I, I'm amazed when I see people who aren't heeding the warnings, quite frankly. I live in the uh, College Drive area of Baton Rouge, and I've seen more and more people masked up, white and black. Uh, initially, that was not the case. But the last week or two, uh, just about most of the places I've been in around my home and business area, people have been more and more wearing masks. But, you know, when you get outside of uh, uh, the city center, people aren't wearing masks. What do you want to tell those people who feel like uh, they can do what they want to do? When I speak to young people, my message to them is always the most important thing that you possess is your health. You can't be a famous doctor, attorney, lawyer, uh, physician, whatever it is that you want to be if you're not healthy, if you don't have your health and wellness. So use your head, stop the spread, put these masks on, social distance, wash your hands, avoid non-essential travel. This too shall pass. It's not that we're insensitive to the loss of jobs, uh, you know, uh, people that are forced to go to work, those that don't have the ability to work from home, don't get paid time off, don't have sick leave. But at this point in time, we've got to do, be responsible. As a physician, I chose this profession. Uh, Sister Iris chose to be a nurse, so we, we put ourselves in harm's way because that's what our profession, we chose to take care of these patients. So if we're going to make sacrifices to help you get better, you owe it to us to follow these rules and regulations, these mandates, because you're putting us at risk when you do things that are dangerous. So it's a give and take. So it's about being a good neighbor, being a good patient, being a good friend, being a good father, you know, husband, whatever it is that you're going to be. So your health, your most important possession, protect that. And that means masking up, washing your hands, socially distancing, uh, one of the things that we're asking you to do. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wood. Carmaine and Daryl, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the mortuary business. You know, unfortunately, this pandemic has brought death to our doorstep. I had a great aunt and uncle to pass. I've had friends to pass and other people uh, like fraternity brothers die. And, you know, most of those people were not in a space or the kind of health uh, uh, that said they should be dying. This is clearly from this pandemic. So uh, this coronavirus is killing people. Uh, when people are, uh, die, they come to you guys. Tell us how you guys uh, are dealing with bodies that you know had coronavirus. Uh, does the coronavirus stay with the body once it dies? How does all of that work and how are y'all dealing with uh, folks who had coronavirus? That is something that's still unknown as to where uh, the virus dies when the host dies. So we are treating everyone as if everyone has the coronavirus. We're disinfecting the bodies and um, the funeral homes. You know, we have to um, treat everyone as if they, they, they are COVID positive. Wow. Here it's, again, it's not the, the, the remains. Um, it's the families that have been and that you're going to be exposed to mostly. You can uh, limit your, your uh, contact with the body if you're not the embalmer. Um, mm -hmm. say. Um, if you're the actual embalmer who has to go in there and, and prepare that body, then you come really close in contact with, with all of the uh, body the fluids. Uh, and so we use universal precautions that we've always used. Um, it's just now we suit up, we suit up head to toe, we, we got the, the shields, everybody is having on shields and masks and everything. Whereas one time it was just the person that was coming in contact mainly with that body. Once that body has been embalmed and disinfected, um, very few uh, can, contact can come from the remains. It's more so from those uh, family members who gather and, and come into your space and, and want to um, uh, visit with their loved ones and they don't care. They're crying. Their their body. They're they're screaming and hollering. So body fluids are are constantly being uh, exposed. They leave tissue. They leave um, all of that uh, mechanism. Everything that they use is left within our um, uh, funeral home. So we have to go in and clean up behind that. So now my staff, who is not an embalmer but maybe just a maintenance person, is now uh, being exposed to something that normally he wouldn't or she wouldn't even have to come in contact. So we constantly disinfecting, constantly wiping down doors. Churches are now telling us they don't want to have services at churches. So now that confines you back to the funeral home. Now we are going strictly 
uh, to Graveside. Um, and we did that for a while. And when the governor released and said that we could start having 10 people, we could start having 25 people, we start release, re, you know, kind of relaxing a little bit. And you tell black people 25 people at a funeral, um, that's 100. <laughs> you tell <laughs> 10, that's, that's 50, you know? And so, right. and then we become the police of that. Um, are we using thermometers to check people to come when they come into our businesses? Um, when I check your temperature and you, you're out of range, uh, I have to be the one to tell you, you can't come in. Uh, and now you're going to tell me, this is my grandmother. I'm coming in there anyway, you know? Um, and so it, I mean, it's just, it's one thing after another, especially with in the African-American community where we don't get it. Sometimes we, we, we don't understand the effects of, of how uh, you spread this virus and how uh, and so it, I mean, it's just, it is to, to mask. After another, especially with any after. So, yeah. you know. We um, also provide masks and disinfectant at the door. You can't come into our, our facilities unless you have on these masks. You surprise how many people show up without a mask or. Right. And, and want to come in or. Um, don't want to put on a mask, um, but, but the majority of them, once you ask them to, um, they will put it on. So that was my next question. Has y'all service offerings had to change? And basically they have, you're having more full fledged funerals at the funeral home, as opposed to, uh, the church. I got to ask y'all people, people want to know, and this is one of the rumors early on, has the cost factors changed for burying people because of this coronavirus pandemic? Actually, our cost, I would say, is less because more people are being cremated and more people are having graveside services. So it's, the cost is less to have a graveside service than it is to have a church service or a service in a funeral home. So I would say it's, it's much less. Yeah, we, don't allow, we don't allow limousines. We don't allow, um, you know, so that cut out that side of the business where you're transporting people from place to place. There are no more repast after the funerals. Uh, so people are saving money on the cost of food and, and trying to feed those families. Uh, and again, a graveside service is less work. Uh, we've had funerals. I know Saturdays, Carmen, I mean, <laughs> Saturdays we finished at 12 o'clock and we had three or four funerals. Whereas on a Saturday, if we had three or four funerals, it would take us an entire day to service all of those families. And you do three gravesides and you're done. And so, I mean, one day I looked up on a Saturday and it was 12 o'clock and we had completed our day, entire day's work um, in a matter of hours. And so that changes the dynamics of, of just our business staffing. Do we, we don't need as much staff because uh, you don't have those drivers. So those are jobs that are now, um, that are lost. Appreciate it. Thank you for filling us in on the uh, funeral service uh, space during COVID-19. We want to ask everybody on the screen to turn their cameras off and bring back Reverend Whitney uh, Castine and Reverend Jonathan Hill. And we're going to talk a little church business. Uh, of course, you know, church and black folks go together like uh, so many axioms. I'm not going to say any because they're all bad. Um, but anyway, uh, Whitney, uh, Jonathan, talk to us about how the faith-based community has dealt with COVID because literally it meant that services were shut down and quite frankly, like my church, New St. John is still sh shut down because most of our membership is elderly. Yeah, so Todd, I think uh, nobody would have ever imagined that you could not go to church one day, right, to a physical building. And so I think initially that shook a lot of people. Uh, but I think since we have kind of navigated this season, people have found new ways to connect online and even found themselves connecting more frequently, right? And so I found that I'm connecting with the members more often than would have typically been a Wednesday and a Sunday morning. But now we're having more small group meetings throughout the week, which I think the members appreciate and found encouraging. But it's also, we found a way to reach new people. Um, and so if your church traditionally had a brick and mortar operation and now you've had to shift to online now you're exposing the ministry to people who may just be scrolling online one day and decide to peep in to see what's going on with your church and so i think we've seen uh, some growth in some areas 
interesting grit. Yeah, one of the things that I've, I've said before, and I, I say every chance that I get, is that while it may be a challenging time for church, it's a great time for ministry. And, uh, and to be clear, when people in the community ask, well, what is the church doing? Or the church ought to be doing this, that, and the other. What they're really saying is, what is the preacher doing? <laughs> uh, what, are, what are the pastors doing? Mm -hmm. um, this is a great time for us to invoke some really innovative ministry um, to reach people without having to touch them physically. And, uh, and so I'm really excited about what this means that we can become. Make no mistake, uh, I'm not excited about death and disease all, all around us, but I am uh, going to be uh, opportunistic and, and really take advantage of this time to help push my church and push others to be more innovative, to be more introspective, to repent, to do all that we can do uh, to make sure that we're representing uh, the gospel in a way that we had not paid enough attention to uh, in the past. Interesting. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, is service. Um, but talk to us about uh, the other staple of church, Bible study on Wednesday. You know, Sunday service is a given, but Bible study is a close second in the African-American uh, church space. Uh, have people been doing their Bible studies on Zoom or uh, Facebook Live? Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, so um, I know my church, we've been doing Zoom. I've seen many of my colleagues on Facebook Live. Uh, I think I enjoy Zoom because it gives me somewhat of a two-way interaction. Uh, you know, for those who share their cameras, I can see them, they can see me. We can have discussion in the chat. Uh, I know other platforms are kind of linear one way, uh, but also we've seen growth in that. And so members who may be older members who may have been afraid to come out in the dark or those who will be working late, it's simple now just to tune in on your way home or share a link. Um, and so I've seen better connectivity, at least on my end, as it relates to those small group opportunities. Yeah, and I would certainly have to agree. And not only have we sort of seen an increase of our overall support for Bible study for Sunday worship, but the quality of our study, the quality of our worship has improved dramatically. I think that people are in a place where they recognize that we all certainly need the Lord, certainly if that's what you proclaim, right? If you proclaim before, you certainly mean it now. Uh, yeah, and so we're, we're seeing ourselves go deeper in our study. Uh, the level of participation is, is up. Uh, it's, it's much uh, more consistent than perhaps uh, what we were doing before with worrying about in person only. And, uh, and, and that's something that I'm certainly encouraged by. You're, you're seeing young people uh, participate in Bible studies. Uh, in fact, our young people created their own at three o'clock on Thursdays, uh, and it's something where, where that's what they want to do, and that's where I meet them in, our, in a way to support them. So what we've been able to see, Todd, um, through this transition is really churches not necessarily going into survival mode, but going into a place where they're not afraid to try out some new stuff. Historic churches, churches that's been here 100, 150, 200 years are trying things that they've never thought to try before to make the gospel even more accessible uh, to folks uh, that they weren't in the previously. I'll just say this and I'll leave it alone. The reason why I say accessible is we know that there's some exclusivity around a church, right? We, we have membership and membership is some folks are in, some folks are out. Uh, in this experience with COVID-19 and, and, and stay at home orders and the like, we're seeing the doors of the church being wide open uh, at the same time the pews are empty. Yeah, you know, uh, the other part of church that is such a uh, robust and uh, important part of church is baptisms and christenings. Uh, what is happening in that space? Because, you know, people are still having babies and babies, you know, in the black community going to be christened or baptized. Uh, what's happening in that space? You know, we are, um, with Trinity, we are part of a denominational church, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and our um, denomination and our health director really helped put together some guidance. And we've received instruction from our body uh, at this time to not do uh, baptisms, not do uh, infant baptisms or christenings, as, as they call in other faith traditions, um, not just because of us sharing water and all of that, 
that stuff. But, you know, that draws people. It's hard to control crowds. And uh, with respect to babies, there's the passing of the child from a parent to me to another child. Uh, and and we were, we're really trying to be careful to um, uh, limit and go down with some exposure. I have a beautiful niece uh, who uh, we had a baptism, uh, infant baptism, uh, scheduled some months ago that we had to put off uh, simply for these reasons, because we would rather be safe than sorry. And although I've been around my niece and been exposed to, to her during this time, I want to lead by example and make sure that what I model is also what I'm expecting of our uh, other congregants. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to close out this uh, church and um, uh, faith-based section and ask you guys, um, you know, this pandemic has 40 million Americans out of work. And of course, whenever people are out of work, African Americans lead the charge in people being out of work. Uh, how has the church dealt with uh, parishioners, members being out of, out of work and uh, needing assistance for uh, bills, for food on the table? So yeah, uh, we've been quite candid and open with our members that uh, you've been supportive of us. And so in the time of need, we wanna support you. And so whatever need that we can meet that you articulate, we will, but also we've been proactive, right? And so uh, just in listening to the feedback when we do kind of what we call membership check-ins, if we hear concerns, we've been proactive in making sure we provide resources, whether it's groceries, whether it's just saying, here's a gift card, right? You hadn't said anything, but here's a gift card to go get you some groceries or whatever you need. Um, during the season, but definitely if there's a need, uh, we still have that open door policy that we are here to serve in the midst of all of this. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. And I, I would certainly agree with that. And in, in addition to that, I think it's important not only to, uh, as churches, with respect to the direct services, right, that we offer those social services, to not just operate um, with a level of compassion, but also uh, operate with a level of discretion uh, in taking care of not putting folks' business out on the street as they may be dealing with uh, a, a difficult time. And the last piece about it, one thing that I've recognized during this time is that, sure, uh, you know, we are one church, we will do what we can, but we've been more successful when we are able to tap the resources of others, other non-members, other churches, other community-based organizations to really lock arms and do what we can to meet people's needs. This is not the time to worry about building our own little empires. Uh, this is not the time to worry about self-preservation. This is a time for us to really stand tall and be the church that God called us to be. And so that means uh, working with the Baptist church around the street. It means working with uh, a group of do-gooders in the, in the community. It means doing whatever we can to make sure that our people, um, their needs are being met. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the candor. Uh, at this time, we're gonna pivot from our church and start talking about um, farmland, Main Street, uh, neighborhood impact, and the business community. Uh, we want to get Danielle, Kirk, Mark, uh, Daryl, Leslie. Uh, we want to get you guys uh, on the screen to talk a little bit about some of the things going on in your workspaces. Uh, and of course, as uh, you know, where you guys work, what you guys do, talk to us a little bit about uh, mass protocols. You know, uh, uh, the governor's got a mass mandate. Uh, the mayor in Baton Rouge, the mayor in New Orleans and Shreveport have a mask mandate, but a lot of these suburbs are uh, mask optional. If the business says you got to wear a mask, you got to wear a mask. And even with a mandate from the governor, you've got people bucking that uh, um, um, request that everybody mask up. And as much as the mask makes sense, people want to challenge that. What's happening around mask at your workplaces? Okay. Uh, Definitely in my workplace. Go ahead, Kurt. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. In the chemical industry, uh, we're very familiar with wearing PPE. Uh, so that's something that we focus on all the time. But I, I got to be totally honest with you. The mask protocol, uh, for instance, today I was out in the, um, in the process area and we have to wear the mask because we're working in close proximity with each other. It's very hot. Out there. Mm -hmm. And the, the resistance to remove that mask is, I'm telling you, it's very difficult to keep it on. I found yeah. myself taking it off just to breathe, you know, and just to relieve myself from the heat. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, 
but we are stressing it. It's something that the companies are stressing. And I got I to gotta give uh, an applause to the people, the, the contractors, the, the actual plant workers, because everybody is focused on wearing the mask, and we do check each other on that. Yeah, beautiful. Leslie? Yes, we're doing mainly uh, telehealth uh, as far as um, social services and um, seeing clients. So we're not really uh, going out face to face with anyone. Mm -hmm. When we do, if we do have a, a, let's say an emergency or a case where you do need to go face to face, we are wearing a mask. Uh, when need be, we are talking with the clients about wearing masks, making sure they understand um, the reason for the mask, the purpose. Um, so basically, we're just trying to educate based on what we're hearing. Uh, we, we just having to give the information. There's nothing that's evidence-based for us. We just have to, what we're here, we just transfer it back, you know, to them. And that's basically we, we, basically what we're using. But I can say telehealth is really, um, it's, it's going well. Good, good. Mark, talk to us about working with the youth. I know that's got to be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is a challenge. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my nephew, uh, but uh, a lot of the places that we go, we make sure we have our mask. Uh, if we're in his car, we have our mask. My car, we have a mask. A lot of people we come in contact with, if they do not have masks, thanks to uh, Senator Price, uh, we're able to give them some masks as we uh, go through the community. Um, Daryl, how, how about in the education arena? Yeah, summertime is going fine right now. I guess the million dollar question is what's going to happen in August? <laughs> you know, um, you know, once the once schools decide on if they're going to go from the hybrid model where students are showing up on campus some days and doing virtual other days. So summertime is, is fine. Like um, when you're on campus, everybody is required to wear a mask. But, you know, you're dealing with all adults right now. Um, but when you have a campus full of kids and custodians and paraprofessionals and cafeteria workers, you know, I don't know how that's going to work out once school starts back up with the mask and, and keeping kids um, with the mask on, you know, while they're at school. You know, uh, y'all, one of the things that um, has been a bit of a challenge is gloves or no gloves. Uh, some people, you know, said wear gloves early on, and then more people said don't wear gloves. Um, the, the thing that has resonated with Todd Sterling about gloves is if you wear gloves, let's say, uh, to the grocery store and you're touching various items, or if some of that item has coronavirus, you're putting coronavirus on other items as you move around with those gloves. Um, and some of the medical professionals I've talked to have said, you know, if you're going to wear the gloves, you need to use them for whatever you're doing and then take them off and throw them away once you're done with that singular task. Uh, in y'all's workplaces, what are y'all doing regarding gloves, no gloves? Well, in, in, the, uh, in the chemical industry, we generally wear gloves all the time when we're out in the field. So that's just common practice for us. It's, it's not out of the norm. Uh, inside of the offices and inside of the admin building, that's kind of a different thing. So uh, it's, it's kind of being up to the individual. The, the gloves are available. Uh, nobody's being forced to wear them. Uh, I do see people wearing them. Some, some of my coworkers wear them. Um, I have worn them inside. I've also forgotten to put them on. I've worn them and I've touched my face with them by accident. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a trying thing. It's very difficult. Daryl. Uh, Hamburg, you talking to me? Yeah. Yeah. I know in my business, when we first started, we were a lack, there were a lack of PPE um, essentials. And it got pretty scary when we couldn't find masks or didn't think we were going to have the, um, the full garments and the shields and, and they were limited. You couldn't find them online. You, our suppliers who normally supply funeral homes with all of those things usually have it in, in just droves and we can get it anytime we need it. But when I call my supplier and he tells me that they don't have any and they don't know when they're going to get any and um, we're wondering where we're going to get it from and this was at the beginning. But immediately um, the, the governor sent out uh, all kinds of 
uh, equipment to the funeral homes, uh, especially, and made sure that we had all of the garments and the body bags and, and the things that we normally have access to that we couldn't get, get a hold to. Today, um, if, if you go in any store, you see masks, you see gloves, you see hand sanitizer um, everywhere. And so I suggest that you continue to uh, use your gloves as needed. But the main thing that we do is wash your hands constantly um, and, and use the, um, the hand sanitizer, which is the best thing because it'll kill the germ immediately uh, before you touch the steering wheel in your car, before you open the door to go in your house. I mean, constantly just use that, that hand sanitizer. That hand sanitizer is something else. My wife, I mean, she is on me every time I hit the door. Oh, could you stop and see if there's some hand sanitizer? That <laughs> could you stop? I'm like, girl, do we need all that? She's like, yes, we need all that. So, But just imagine if you're a germaphobe, you know, there were people who were already really, really sensitive to all of those things prior to that. And, you know, you have some people that they wouldn't leave home without hand sanitizer before COVID. Girl. So you, you know can that? imagine now where this is something where it's over- you know, it puts people into anxiety and all sorts of things. And, you know, there was one time that I didn't really understand the germaphobes and, and just feeling like I need to do hand sanitizer constantly. But now I can say my hands feel kind of strange. Without <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wash it all, everything off. Yeah, constantly. It's like, you, know, <laughs> you have, I have to use it, con you know, constantly at this point. Daryl, Mark, how about you guys? Yeah, I don't know if any of y'all have um, educators in your family, but especially middle school and the elementary educators, like gloves, gloves won't do us any good, man, because like, we're never keeping still. We're always on the go touching, uh, doing uh, laptops, printers. So uh, we'll go through, you know, two, three boxes of gloves if we use them um, all the time. So I started off practicing um, using gloves, you know, uh, with my family and on the job. But as the, uh, as the summer progressed and, 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 and quarantine progressed while we out virtually, I kind of went away from the gloves and just started using hand sanitizer and making sure I was washing my hands um, you know, more often. Pretty much the same thing here, uh, more hand sanitizer, not as much uh, with the gloves. I think my wife has a closet full of sanitizer if anybody needs any. <laughs> well, you know, you could probably make a lot of money on that. Uh, uh, I can. Talk. Talk to me, y'all, uh, as we wrap up this this uh, segment about, you know, um, all you in education, I know that it's pretty consistent with what you do, but, you know, um, um, Kurt, uh, Leslie, Daryl, you on the business side of things, um, has it been profitable times or you guys challenged financially in your workspaces? Uh, because uh, I I've seen people who are doing fantastic uh, during this COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, I saw something online where uh, the, the wealthy have made $500 billion uh, during this two, three month pandemic time, you know, in, in their positions. Um, uh, and I've seen some businesses that are doing phenomenal business. And I assume grocers and food suppliers are really, really doing gangbusters. I think Netflix is probably printing money uh, and those those people who provide entertainment services. But uh, Daryl, have have you seen, um, uh, you, you and D Carmen talked about it, uh, Carmaine talked about it earlier. Uh, have you seen um, uh, a little bit of uptick in revenue or is it uh, about neutral? Again, uh, cost of funerals, uh, or the type of funerals that we're doing now, the cost has gone down. We're doing more funerals um, and at the same time, people are still spending the same amount of money that they would have on a church service where they're going to be in contact with the public. You know, in, in, the, in our community, it's about the kind of casket that you had. Oh, he had a nice casket or, or he didn't have a nice casket. But if you're going to a graveside service, what, you know, it, it's not that public appeal anymore. And so, but people are still uh, wanting to see their loved ones put away in that same, they haven't changed um, uh, and said, well, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna spend this money this way since we're not having a, a, a service in, in the public, we're gonna still uh, do uh, what we would have done for mom in, in this case or for, for their loved one. So you see 
Um, I talked about limousines and all of those add-on things, uh, programs. <coughs> Excuse me, you don't need as many programs. You used to have to have a thousand programs at a funeral to make sure everybody got one. Right. Now, if you only got 10 people there, I mean, or 25 people, you know, you don't, you don't make as many. So th some things have changed. Uh, you don't have to buy flowers as much, uh, or people are not sending flowers because they know that it's a graveside service. Uh, so in many instances, it has changed the way we we spend our money. Um, I see a lot of people going online. Uh, we did even did the online services where people could attend uh, services online uh, from afar. Uh, many of us are, are practicing that as well. So, um, Leslie. Uh, Carmaine, where you at, Carmaine? Leslie. Yeah, well, as far as social, I mean, it, there is a financial impact, I guess, because we are not seeing clients as we would have, or, you know, getting more clients to come in. Um, everything is telehealth, and then usually if you don't have those clients already active, it's kind of hard, it's difficult to get out and, you know, getting involved with different people or new people to try to get them in. Do they need the services? I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of people that may need services at this time, but it's difficult getting them into the agency due to the restrictions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Daryl and Mark, can y'all speak to the education system and the impact of what will happen if school doesn't happen on people like uh, janitors and cafeteria workers and the uh, school bus drivers and things like that. Um, talk to us a little bit about those spaces. I know before we left in March, um, like I said, it was a it was a plan that was in motion. Um, you know, I guess as the superintendent and board was getting it from Governor Edwards, they, they related to us. Um, so they had to use the bus drivers in different ways. When we had to go virtual school, we had to get laptops out to those parents in the community that may have not had transportation. You know, bus drivers came out and picked up um, laptops and, and different supplies and delivered it to homes. I know during that time when, uh, when the district was providing food for families at lunchtime, a lot of our cafeteria um, workers would come out and they would work and volunteer. So um, as far as people showing up and coming to work and, um, and then with our teachers being able to work virtually, like, and like everybody still had, um, you know, still had their jobs and things that they need to do. And sometimes it may have been outside of their um, regular scope of their job description, um, but they did have other things to do. So it didn't affect anybody's job as far as um, showing up to work or being able to work virtually from home. One thing that, I, that I've been able to do this summer instead of uh, uh, in-person camps uh, for the kids, I've been able to team up with Big Buddy uh, program out of Baton Rouge to do virtual arts and crafts uh, for the last seven weeks. And uh, we've been able to pass out about 300 kits that are free uh, to kids here in the community, in Donaldsonville and in other areas to help some of those kids during this summertime uh, at home. That's interesting. I actually do some work for Big Buddy also. We've been actually uh, videotaping the uh, at home activities. So they actually produce these videos for these kids to do these arts and crafts, dance, acting lessons at home. And it's really been, uh, I thought, a bright idea. And it kind of gives the kids something to look forward to. So thank you for the work that you do with those kids. Uh, you know, Daryl and I both uh, have a uh, relationship with the River Road African American Museum. He's one of the co founders and our executive director. I'm the uh, board president. And you know, in the museum's world, the museum space has been challenging because we've not been able to have visitors. And so we had to turn the corner and have virtual exhibits. And so we've had to uh, create uh, a whole series of things to get people to come to our website, our Facebook page, our Instagram and other social platforms. And uh, it's really been positive. Uh, you know, we've really gotten some kudos because people are looking for things to do. And uh, those things usually come from TV, phone, uh, iPads, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we, we look forward to hopefully having the, the, the experience to have people back into the museum space. But, you know, I think that everybody's got to realize 
got to do something a little bit different. Uh, so if you get a chance, you've never seen the River Road African American Museum, go check us out uh, and, and see the things that we do there. So uh, I want to do that. I want to ask you, Kirk, on the petrochemical side before we got to our next steps with uh, the senator and the representative. Uh, has uh, the petrochemical industry, it's been business as usual, or have you all seen an uptick or downtick in revenue? Well, for the most part, it's been business as usual. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of products that are being used to fight the, the, this virus and to protect the citizens. Uh, so we, we actually provide those. So it's, it's kind of been business as usual for us. Now, uh, on the other aspect, there's contract workers that work for the plant. You know, y'all y'all know how, how it is, turnarounds around here. Uh, they've been affected a little differently than we have. Uh, I know a lot of people have been laid off. Um, I know people personally that that's been laid off. So that's, that's been kind of trying. Um, yeah. But as far as my personal um, wallet, I've been okay. And uh, there's been a lot of overtime, you know, with people being sick and people having to miss uh, being quarantined as an opportunity to make a little extra money, so. Incredible. Thank you for that. All right, we're gonna turn the page here and I'll uh, bring on uh, State Rep Ken Brass and uh, State Senator Ed Price uh, and talk a little bit about uh, politics and, and things that are happening in the community. Is uh, I think Ken is on. Uh, Howard, did, did we get Ken up on the screen? Uh, and, um, Leslie, you can turn your camera off. Kurt, you can turn your camera off for a bit. Uh, Ken, you there? Hello, hello? Ken Brass? Okay, no Ken Brass. All right, um, uh, Senator Price, uh, talk to us about uh, some of the things happening in the political space. Uh, there's been some federal dollars that have been committed to COVID-19 relief. Uh, you know, I think Trump gave out a trillion dollars. Uh, it's uh, interesting, uh, you know, to see someone give away a trillion dollars. Uh, I, I had uh, some some real concern that you're giving it to companies who don't pay taxes, but that's a whole conversation for another day. Uh, talk to us a little bit about is that COVID-19 relief working or not? Because some people gave uh, there's Ken. Some people gave, uh, got $1,200 checks. Uh, some people didn't get any money. And, uh, you know, a lot of businesses for sure got relief. Tell us y'all's position on the federal dollars committed to COVID-19. Right, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the the trillion dollar package, the state of Louisiana in its initial uh, uh, money that they got was like $1.8 billion. And uh, of course, that's not the stimulus part. And also the federal government uh, sent out the stimulus $1,250 to a lot of family. And then uh, they also added $600 a month through Congress passed that bill to unemployment, people who are unemployed. So people in the state of Louisiana actually get $247 if you're unemployed plus the $600. They was getting like $847 a week. So that was if you... Uh, qualified, if you were eligible, you were able to do that. But one of the things that uh, the legislature did, and we had a very short session, we we went in, the day we actually went in the session, uh, we got word, the governor announced doing his uh, joint uh, statement to the, well, it was a, a joint session, that uh, the first case of coronavirus was in the state of Louisiana. So from that point, we went from a, another seven days and then we recessed and went home and we didn't go back in till May 15th. So we, we had a very short session, but we, we got some things done during the regular session. And of course we went into a special session which lasted another 30 days. But during that time, the legislature actually was able to, to take some of that money. It was like $811 million that we divvied up $300 million to, uh, to, to individuals and then, uh, well, it was going to small business. That was a bill that was passed, HB 70. 
and then the uh, rest of it goes to local government, $511 million. But in that, and, and I want everyone to understand too, small business, the 300 is actually 275 million now because 25 million of that was cut out. But to that point, small business can apply for a grant. It's not a loan, it's a grant of up to $15,000 for business for expenses that you incur. For example, the funeral home, I heard uh, the RM saying that they had to buy sanitizers, gloves, other stuff like that. That is eligible to be part of that grant to get that money back. Any expense dealing with COVID-19, you could get that back. So that was a part of it. But the, the, the thing we, we did and the uh, Legislative Black Caucus and Democratic Caucus uh, members, basically we cut $40 million out of that for minority businesses. So people need to know that minorities have has a $40 million cut of that pot just for minority business. So if you're a minority, uh, African-American women and veterans, you can apply for that money, that $15,000. So that's something that we really need to get out. We really, we, I got it on my web page, got it on my uh, Instagram, to let people know that that money is available. The other part of it uh, was the uh, frontline workers. And that bill started in the house and I'll let uh, Representative Brass tell you exactly what they did in order to, to cut another $50 million out of that in order to go to frontline workers. So uh, Ken, if you're there, you can explain what y'all did in the house. That bill eventually passed also. But we're gonna work hard to make sure that these minority businesses out there get some of this money. And like I say, it's $15,000 per business. So you can go to, it's called a Main Street Recovery Grant Program. It's being run by the uh, Treasurer's Office. Uh, actually, post away in Netterville, uh, uh, the uh, overseers of the money, they, they, they're kind of like was a contract to come in and, and, and do it. So that money is there. You can go to the Louisiana Treasurer website and go to Main Street Recovery, and the applications are there. And this program is starting now. So please encourage minority businesses to go there. The first 60 days, that's when uh, you can get it in all minorities. If nobody applied for all the money at that after the first 60 days, then it's gonna go to, uh, it goes back into the pot. So we are encouraging minority businesses to at least come in and get some of those dollars. Uh, Representative Brass, uh, you wanna talk about the uh, frontline workers bill that you all did? Are we hearing him? Howard, can you check uh, Brass's mute? Can you hear us, Ken? Ken, you're on mute now. On unmute. Make sure all your devices are unmuted, Ken. Representative Brass. All right, let's try this. While they're trying to get uh, uh, Ken up, I do want to ask uh, Rep. Price. So if uh, you receive the PPP money or the EIDL money, can you get this grant that you were talking about? You're not eligible. If you receive any other funding with the EDIL or the PPE, then you're not eligible for this money. So okay. that, that is something that, that we also is putting out there to let people know, no, you, you're not eligible. Only one pot of money you can get. That's it. One pot. Ken, you 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 there? You can hear you. Buddy. Ken, on I'll talk a little bit about the uh, frontline uh, worker bill. Uh, what it was is uh, they called out fifty million dollars out of that uh, pot of money. Also, twenty five million came from the three hundred million with the uh, small business, and the other out of the government out of the government pot. To say fifty million dollars to give, and the stimulus check came, and a lot of people were saying, you know, that was from the Fed. What is the state going to do? Well, and it's not a lot, but it's two hundred and fifty dollars that that uh, all the frontline workers will be getting. 
uh, you got to go online again and apply. It's, and this one is being handled through the Department of Revenue. Uh, and just the, the eligibility uh, <laughs> online workers, we're talking about uh, long term uh, care facility personnel, outpatient co workers, personal assistance providers, home health providers, uh, home delivery and meal providers. Uh, child care service providers, fire and rescue personnel, law enforcement personnel, public health, uh, bus drivers, sanitation personnel, gas station personnel, all these people who were out during the COVID-19 still having to go to work so that service could, could be there. Grocery store uh, and convenience store people. Uh, and, and Dara and Carmen, y'all be glad to know mortuary service provider is also going to get those checks. Uh, veterinary service staff. Those, uh, there's a long list of, of eligibility that's at, on the website. I will tell you people, please go to the website, look at it. The application is there and uh, apply for this money. And it is on the first come first service basis. It's $50 million, $250 per person. So please tell them to, to go out there and do the, uh, to uh, plug into these dollars. It's very important that uh, our people get some of this money. I appreciate you talking about the money side of things. Um, hopefully, uh, Rep. Brass can get back on the, uh, the the Zoom meeting with his phone. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question. Uh, realistically, what can politicians do to get people to mask up? And, uh, and not push back on uh, that common sense thing to do that stops the spread of coronavirus. You're absolutely correct. And, and it all starts from the top. Uh, let's face it, we had a president out here talking about you don't need the mask and you didn't need to do these things. And he's got these people who follow him. If, if he walk into the river, they're going to walk into the river with him. And it's a shame to say it, but that's just the way it seemed to be with some people. Uh, I think in this, the way this, the numbers are rising again, more and more people are beginning to realize that they have to wear a mask. Mask is now one of the ways to protect yourself. When you wear a mask, you're protecting, your, you're protecting you from other people. When other people wear a mask, they're protecting them from you. So we got to make sure that, that this is working. I know at the Capitol, we had people uh, that just refused. They weren't going to wear a mask. And if they would come up to talk to me, I would just try, hey, wait, if you're not going to put a mask on, stand back six, at least six to eight feet away from me. You got to talk a little louder, but that's fine. But uh, they had some that wouldn't do it. I went to uh, to the Capitol today. We had a meeting, and I would say 90% of the people had their masks on. Today. So that, that is incredible. Yeah, that is a difference in what is happening. Now, how do we do it? We just got to, to tell people. Uh, it was this morning I saw where the president of Livingston Parish said that he was not going to enforce the governor's mandate to wear a mask. You know, these are the things that has to stop. Uh, if you're not going to enforce it, don't come out and tell people, basically, because you're telling people don't put a mask on. But that was Leighton Ricks in, in Livingston Parish who said he wasn't going to enforce it. So we got to find a way. I mean, we can pass laws. But if the, the law-abiding people say, I'm not going to enforce it, what you going to do? It's, it's kind of hard. But I think the virus itself is getting to the point where people are realizing that I got to put a mask on. So that is a good thing. I'd say 90% of my colleagues today had masks on in the chamber. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, Ken, you with us yet? You got your, your mic working? Try your uh, mute on your phone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine now. All right. Uh, you need to turn your computer off. Just shut your computer now so you don't get the background noise. All right. Yeah, just shut it down. To, uh, close the Zoom meeting on your computer. Well, he's using the audio. Huh? He's using the audio uh, video on the computer and audio off his phone. Oh, okay. My bad. Let me shut up. Keep the camera on and just turn the mic off. Turn the volume down. Right. Talk in. 
Representative Barris, if you would, uh, just do a mic check. Uh, unmute both devices, Representative um, Barras. Okay, Representative Barras. Technology, folks. <laughs> Howard, can you mute his uh, computer and just leave his phone? Well, no, on? that's the speaker he has going on. So the sound is coming in, and he has to turn that speaker down. Turn, turn the speaker volume. down. All right, Representative, let's unmute the uh, other device that you had unmuted. You should be able to unmute the device, uh, Representative Brass. Uh, we're getting an echo because the other device microphone is on. So if you can, um, it's echoing. Just, just go ahead. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what, while, while he still tries to work that out, uh, Senator Price, talk, talk to us a little bit about um, what you see politically coming down the pike uh, for Louisiana as we enter the last half of 2020. Uh, are y'all gonna have a special session regarding uh, COVID-19, regarding education? Uh, um, are y'all going to uh, have a special session in regards to dealing with all these people that are out of work? What's the, have, have, what, what's the, what's the plan uh, with so much uncertainty around what's happening uh, in Louisiana specifically, uh, in the political arena, what's what's the plan for the rest of the year? Yeah, as we move forward, uh, right now there's definitely talk of another special session in, in October. Uh, by that time, we'll know from the federal government any additional money that's coming down. They're talking about another stimulus package. And so, yes, October 15th, it's, it seemed like the day that we may be going back into another special session that's tentative at this point, but we, we will have a special session because you're right, there's so many things that we got to go back in to talk about unemployment, uh, that uh, if we're going to do something in the state of Louisiana because our unemployment is only $247 a month, which uh, is not a lot, so we may have to uh, look at putting additional dollars into our unemployment uh, system so that we can continue in employment. We got a lot of people out of work right now. Uh, and I think we are running probably about, uh, I think it's $4 million a month in unemployment benefits that's going out. So uh, at some point, that fund's gonna start to run real low. So yes, we're gonna have to do something and we can use uh, dollars that coming in to, to build that back up. So the special session, it's definitely gonna be there. You talk about the schools, right now they're still talking about opening schools somewhere around August 6th, uh, uh, give a few days here or there. If, uh, that's gonna be some virtual schooling, that's gonna be some in-classroom schooling, but at the same time, we gotta be careful. We know uh, the best way to get educated is in the classroom, but if something happened, uh, what do we do? I know the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education actually uh, passed some guidelines this afternoon. I have not had an uh, opportunity to, to, to look at them and read them. I think it was almost like 5, 30, 6 o'clock when they finally voted on the uh, final piece that they're going to be uh, guidelines that they're sending down to the local district. But though all of those things we got to look at and make sure that, well, first of all, protecting our children, protecting our teachers, protecting all of those who work at, in, into the school system, the bus drivers and everybody else. This, this virus is here and it's not going anywhere. So we got to make sure that we take care of our people. Our healthcare system can get overloaded in, in a hurry. We saw that in, in back in uh, late February and early March. It can very well happen again. So uh, at, at, in the political arena, it's a tough thing. It seems as if when we first got back into the Capitol, it was like, okay, 
our people not dying and we don't care. And that's the wrong attitude to have. But I'm telling you, we round them every day. They wouldn't wear their masks. They, they didn't social distance. And they didn't care. And here we are, everybody wearing our masks. And we're trying to do the right thing and make sure. But now it's hitting their community hard. And everybody's getting it. Lake Charles area right now is the highest uh, area that, that this disease, this pandemic is hitting. So it's, it's now no longer New Orleans Bat Druid where and a, the River Parish is statewide. So everybody got to be very careful and, and we just got to move forward. But yes, there will be a special session. Can you get your mic going? Can you hear me? We can hear you perfect. <laughs> Great. Oh, all right. Well, I definitely apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, actually, it's been a busy evening for myself. I had the opportunity to uh, attend a couple of school board meetings. I uh, just kind of respond upon what Senator Price said as far as uh, the importance and the criticality of our schools being safe uh, for our students to go back in, and not only our students, but for our uh, teachers uh, to go back. Uh, one of the biggest pushes now, as I sit on, sat on the Education Committee meeting, is just the, the concerns uh, not here in the rural parishes, but throughout the state with teachers, uh, whether it's going to be, uh, whether you got to go back in front of school, whether they'll be doing it virtual, uh, whether they'll be testing available, whether they had the proper PP as far as masks, uh, to where they can feel secure and safe to ultimately when they go home at the end of the day, they can go home to their fam family with a, a source of uh, confidence to where they, whether they've been protected. So that's going to be a big, big piece. Uh, there was some funding actually came, that came down through the CARES Act funds that's, that was allocated to each district based upon, pretty much based upon their Title I funds. So a lot of those schools are using that, that fund toward uh, equipment to send out to the kids uh, as far as testing protocols, as far as uh, mask and PPE. So uh, that's going to be the big push, um, as Senator Price mentioned, as far as getting out kids in school, whether it's virtually or hybrid, uh, full-time in school, um, safely. Safely, so that that's uh, going to be a big push to ensure that we our kids are educated, but at the same time where they can go to school and learn uh, in safe uh, learning environment. Well, let me uh, close out this political uh, session uh, by asking y'all uh, an important question in Louisiana: Will there be a football season? I saw that uh, there was some legislation to uh, shut down fall sports. Uh, and then, you know, of course, everybody would love to have the national champion LSU Tigers uh, play. But and then, you know, on a personal note, I produce Southern University's uh, head football coach, Dawson Odom's TV show. So it seems like uh, in Louisiana, either you're connected or touched uh, by football or you just love football. It seems to be our, one of the passions of our state. Uh, what is y'all's take? On do you see us having a football season? I think that's all going to be depending yeah. on uh, how we react as a community as far as um, um, not spreading the coronavirus um, in our community and in our schools. Um, as I mentioned yesterday at our, our meeting, uh, I'm a strong proponent of doing all that we can to having all fall sports, not only football, but all fall, fall sports, as long as we put in safety measures and as long as the timing is correct. Uh, I do believe that sports are important as far as bringing our communities together, you know, especially here in real parishes. In addition to sports being important to our communities, we have a lot of kids that's in our African-American communities that do well in school because they want to be eligible to play sports. And then thirdly, sports is critical to real parish um, guys here, students, is that a lot of time athletic scholarship are their way out to the next level, not only to get play sports at a collegiate level, but to ultimately get their college education to where they can prosper in life. So um, I had a lengthy conversation with the athletic, direct, athletic association director on yesterday after the meeting. Um, and I think they're committed to put all the, uh, the protocols in place to where once uh, phase three come into play that they can put some implement some procedure where we can have small sports, including uh, football. They are, see, I think he kind of misquoted yesterday as far as a, a phase four. Uh, and a lot of people kind of drew up a red flag for the one that what phase four was. So that's, he was just considering that as the phase that's kind of the end of part of phase three. So if you look at the recommendations that are brought upon us, uh, brought down by the athletic association, there's actually three tiers. Tier one being in like the players, the coaches, and the uh, staff. Tier two being including tier one along with the media. And then tier three would be 
where the uh, fans will come into play. So um, that's all going to be critical as far as how we, as a community, as a state, and residents throughout this country, uh, start to take this virus seriously and start to social distance, uh, maintain our distancing uh, at schools, at work, at home, to ultimately where we can move forward uh, and see our kids play sports as we move forward into the fall. You know, we got to give a little shout out. Uh, you got a state champion in your area. I was in the Superdome to see the St. James. Uh, are they the Wildcats? Uh, yes, yes. They, they won the state championship. Coach Robert Valdez, an SU alum, and one of uh, my fraternity brothers, Elmo LaBeouf, was assistant coach. Uh, they brought home that championship to your district. So uh, I know y'all are chomping at the bit to see some football at St. James, as well as a lot of the other high schools down there as football is super important. Uh, Representative Price, what's your take on uh, sports in the fall? Well, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the college piece because we've had some conversation uh, about uh, some hybrid plans with that. Right now, I know in certain conferences, they're talking about only playing conferences games. So uh, that would eliminate some of the travel. Uh, instead of having to travel to California to play USC or USC coming here and you, you, you're in a close proximity, say if you're in the SEC, you're talking about uh, going to Texas, uh, uh, Georgia, Alabama, and the schools like that. So it, it limiting some of the travel, the, the SWAC conference, the same thing, uh, limiting the amount of travel. As I understand right now, uh, we do have some uh, football games. Uh, the bands will not be traveling with the team. They play for home game, but they will not be able to travel. Those are all discussion right now. As long as uh, this pandemic is happening and this coronavirus is out there, it's going to be some uh, some modifying on how we do it. And even in the stadium, uh, talk about uh, the Saints, the professional league. They're talking about maybe putting 20,000 people in the dome. I don't know how you would do that. Uh, your season ticket holders, 65,000, but only 20,000 can attend a, a, a game. Uh, in LSU Stadium, uh, modifying that the way so many people can attend one game and then some on, on the other game. So there's a lot of talk about it. I do feel that at some point we're probably going to get back to having some sports. Uh, it's a big relief for people to go out and enjoy themselves. But we got to do it in a safe manner. We got to do social distancing. And uh, it's just one thing that, that is, I call it the new normal. And it may be wrong for a while. There's a new normal that's here, and it's not going away. So this is a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to get everybody back in so we can have some closing remarks. If everybody can turn back on their uh, uh, cameras, and, and, and we're going to kind of give a little uh, round robin on uh, some closing remarks on what you want to say to our fellow Louisianians as we try to deal with this pandemic. I'm asking everybody to be brief and be intentional. We're gonna start with you, Daryl. Uh, why don't you start off with saying your piece? You're on mute, Daryl. Come around, Hamburg. 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 Uh, just like to say thanks to Get Serious Louisiana. This is a, a great opportunity for, for us to come together and just have these conversations. It has been very therapeutic for me just to have somebody else to talk to who's going through similar things and, and from various places to understand that we're all pretty much uh, faced with the same same situations and uh, to see how others are dealing with it um, kind of gives you a little uh, relief to know that um, everybody's pretty much in the same boat. And so once again, thank you, Todd, for, for putting this together. Thank all of the panelists for coming out and being a part of this. This was an awesome opportunity. For those who didn't get a, a chance to be a part of it, uh, you missed out on, on something really great. Uh, Leslie? Yes, I'd like to also say thank you for the invite. And uh, it was very informative. And if I had to uh, give any information to anyone, I would just want to say at this point in time, it's not a time to be selfish need to be um, really thinking about other people at this time because there's a lot of people experiencing things that uh, we've never experienced before. And uh, as a social worker, we don't even know how to address a lot of issues because there are really no answers at this point. 
We don't know exactly how long it's going to be. A lot of things that we've discussed in the past was evidence-based. We have no evidence at this point on how to address these issues and what tactics to take. So at this point, wear your mask, do whatever the government, the government is telling you to do as far as protecting yourself and others, the right thing to do. And I just want to say, just think about others before you think about yourself or as you think about yourself. That's a good sentiment. Thank you, uh, Leslie. Daryl Comrie, what you got to say? This one, first I'll start off by saying thank you for allowing me to uh, share the platform with the rest of the um, professionals that's on here. Um, as far as education, I know that's a hot topic man, for everybody in the state of Louisiana, and we all want our kids to, to make sure that they're in the classroom being educated, but I just want to make sure everybody realizes that, man, we should put our kids first um, and their health first and our teachers, faculty, and staff. And just know that, um, you know, if, if we're sending our students back, especially in our high poverty, high minority areas, if we're sending them back to school without the proper, um, without the proper protocol procedures, um, it could turn out worse than, than what it really is now. So just want to make sure that we're putting the students and faculty and staff first. Thank you. Mark Peters. Uh, I want to thank you guys again for allowing me to be here uh, to share with you guys today. Uh, one thing that I want to say is for everybody to be safe and sanitized uh, and mass, mass, mass. Thank you very much. Dr. Whitfield, drop some knowledge on us. You're on mute, brother. Whit, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I was having little technical difficulties over here. I'll make it brief. Um, get up in the morning, guys, as you did before the outbreak. Get dressed, make your bed, eat breakfast, walk a mile every day, check in on your friends, watch TV just enough to keep update, uh, but turn it off. And I just advise you guys to trust the medical community to do their best, keep the politics out of the mix, continue to cook, eat healthy meals, and remember that this too shall pass. Be careful, but do not be fearful. Thank you. Uh, how about you, uh, Reverend Joe Nathan Hill? Uh, thanks again, Todd, for the opportunity to be here to share. Uh, echo everyone's sentiments, but I'll also share with you, back in the days when we could fly, the pilot would always tell you, put your mask on first, or you try and take care of somebody else. And so I would encourage us to make sure we put our mask on, and we never argue with the pilot about putting the mask on when trouble comes. And so let's put those masks on and get out there and be safe and look out for one another. That's a good one. I like that. Put your mask on first. <laughs> How about you, um, Iris? Yes, I would like to thank you all for inviting me to this panel. It has been an awesome um, panel, a lot of informative information. Um, we here in the rural area of Donaldsonville, uh, I have one thing to say to the politicians to look into um, transportation for these patients. They have transportation coming from Homer to bring them around the corner to their dialysis treatments. So that's just a little tidbit that I would like to say. And I would like to also say that we need to stay safe, quarantine when we need to, and sanitize also. Thanks. Ms. Carmaine Dickerson. I also like to thank you all for the opportunity to be a part of this platform. And I would like to say we need to get serious. Um, yearly funeral homes, they do, we do a, um, a count of our cases per year and the most cases we have ever had at this point in July we have surpassed that number and we've been in business for 62 years so it is serious it's, we need to get serious people are dying due to this COVID thank you Reverend Castine Thank you so much. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, this is not an issue of faith. This is an issue of fact. Uh, so let us do what we need to do. Um, trust God, but trust also in the uh, medical community that God created. Trust in the politicians that God lifted up for such a time as this. And of course, uh, use your head and stop the spread. Thank you, sir. Representative Brass. Thank you. I'd like to commend you for hosting this uh, 
Todd and to all the panelists for participating, taking time out of the busy schedule. Um, and I would just like to ask everyone that we, and stress to everyone that we need to be our own brothers and sisters keepers. Uh, and by doing that, we can definitely mass up, we can social distance, sanitize, and also get tested up to know your status so that we can help stop the spread uh, throughout the River Parish and throughout the state of Louisiana. Senator Price. Yes, I too want to thank you all for this panel. It's been very, very informative hearing from the funeral home directors, Dr. Whitfield, the ministers. It, it, it's just a great thing that we can get here and have this discussion. So thank you all very much. And my thank to the people of the state of Louisiana is mass up. We have to stop the spread and mass up. Kurt Mitchell. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, well, for whatever reason, my video is, uh, it's not allowing me to go to video, but if you can hear me, I'd like to thank you guys for doing this, for putting this together. I know a lot of times we get caught up in our own personal thing. So this was a good opportunity to be able to see uh, how it's affecting other areas of life, different people in, in uh, different situations. So I'd like to thank y'all again for that. Uh, very, very proud to be a part of this panel. You guys were very, um, very uh, informative and I certainly do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Ms. Danielle Plaisance. Is the staff sergeant still with us? Can y'all hear me now? We can, yes. thank you. Okay, first of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to be a part of the panel. The information that I heard tonight, I am able to go back not only into the community, but also back to my work community, my family members, and give them some of the knowledge that I was able to intake from tonight's session. It was very informative and I do appreciate it. As for, you know, not just the people that's on the panel, but also for the viewers out there, all we can do is ask each and every last one of you to continue following the guidelines that not just the CDC has issued to us, but also follow the mandates that John, Governor John Bell Edwards have handed down to us. You know, and like everybody else is saying, we can get through this as a community. Pray on it, put it in the hands of the Lord, and we are going to eventually get there. Thank you, um, Danielle. You know, guys, um, I wanna say thank y'all for coming together. I thought this was uh, a good opportunity to hear from uh, what I call uh, rank and file Louisianians. A lot of times uh, the people that we hear from are the academics and the uh, political people that, you know, uh, don't really uh, deal with uh, a lot of the regular issues like how to put grocery on the table. And um, I really wanted to have some uh, conversation around people who uh, work with people in that space and are dealing with that space because to me uh, it is up to us to help those people uh, in this time. Uh, so thank you all for your candor. Thank you all for sharing uh, the wealth of your knowledge. Uh, for everybody out there who inevitably somebody is gonna say, I didn't know about this. I didn't hear about this. Nobody told me about this. Uh, this is gonna be repeated. I think uh, you can catch it on the Get Serious Louisiana Facebook page. I think we're gonna try to have it on the River Road African American Museum. Facebook page. Uh, I think I'm going to have it on my uh, company, Alpha Media and Public Relations Facebook page. So it can be seen again. Uh, if somebody wants to check it out, you know, send them to those platforms to catch it and uh, catch the benefit of some of this knowledge. Uh, some of the other closing remarks are the state has set up uh, uh, a lot of resources to help Louisianians in this pandemic. Uh, I've actually been pleased with uh, what uh, Reverend John Bell Edwards has done in regards to trying to help Louisianians. Uh, Howard, can you bring up that graphic with those resources uh, for the people to be able to catch? Uh, 
you know, one of them is the website coronavirus.la.gov. Uh, you know, it's the state's website in regards to this pandemic. Everything that you could possibly want to know about this pandemic uh, is housed on that uh, website. And there's great links and great information. Uh, there's also a text la COVID uh, to, to six six seven two eight three. Text la COVID to six seven two eight three for up to date information on the coronavirus. Uh, again, that is updated daily uh, uh, by the uh, governor's office, and uh, it gives out good information if you want to know uh, what's going on with uh, la COVID. Uh, in, in the state. The other resource is the Keep Calm During COVID hotline. Uh, it is uh, a, a hotline to call and talk with counselors that can help people who are dealing with uh, stress, anxiety, uh, even mental health and substance abuse. Uh, there's counselors that are available for you to talk to, uh, to speak with. So if you know somebody in your family, in your social circle, who really needs uh, those services, uh, tell them to call the Keep Calm at the COVID hotline. Uh, there's no shame in the game. You know, you just get the people some help. Uh, right now, I think people are under undue stress in regards to work, in regards to bills, in regards to putting food on the table. And so, you know, I think that uh, the right counselor uh, can help them and. Let's be honest, y'all, in the black community, uh, therapy ain't our thing, but it's starting to be. And if we uh, promote it and we uh, are active about, you know, getting our uh, people to the table, they can get some help uh, before they do something that hurts themselves. So um, the other thing is continue to check out the Get Serious Louisiana Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter page. And... Uh, this campaign will pivot into a campaign called Exercise Your Faith as uh, uh, we tried to go into the communities around the state. Uh, there's a exerciseyourfaith.org website and there'll be an Exercise Your Faith Facebook page where you can get some information on nutrition, on health disparities, on defending yourself and your families from COVID-19. So trying to provide a wealth of information to uh, the communities in Louisiana on how to uh, not only defend your, yourself and your families against this pandemic, but also on how to become healthier. Uh, one of the most tragic things about this pandemic, it was almost sinister in the fact that it has seemed to attack comorbidities in the African-American community uh, a lot stronger than it did uh, other races. And uh, with that said, I think it's a responsibility on us to try to reach out to our community and get them the best information that we can in regards to dealing with health disparities, in regards to dealing with uh, COVID-19. So uh, I'm asking all of you guys who were on the call today to be ambassadors for uh, the Get Serious Louisiana campaign, to be ambassadors for exercise your faith because I believe if you know we reach out and touch one two four five uh, you know hopefully they can touch some people and we can get them the protections that uh, maybe other people don't want us to have so uh, let's be smart about it let's stay prayed up and uh, let's try to maybe do this again sometime in the future uh, if if needed if we can't uh, uh, change the arc of this coronavirus uh, pandemic so Again, I appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate everyone who tuned in. Thank you, Daryl Hambrick, for being my co-host this evening. Uh, you know, Daryl didn't say much tonight, and that is so unlike Daryl. Let me tell you, all y'all who know Daryl. <laughs> well, so, it was a good time for me to listen and learn, and sometimes I need to shut up and listen. And <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thanks again, Daryl. I enjoyed it. And uh, thank, thank, you. You, ha thank you, Howard White, for uh, driving and and, and helping us with our technology issues and making sure everybody was up on the screen and everybody had their microphone on. Uh, Howard White with Business Growth Dynamics, check him out if you, if you can use his services. He's been doing some great things in this Zoom meeting space. 
if somebody in your organization needs it. So again, use those resources we talked about. I want to wish everybody a good night uh, and take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat>